Guys, we are here for an extended conversation about the new film, The Goldfinch, and we are pleased to be joined on the Real Blend podcast by the director, John Crowley, and his cinematographer, Roger Deakins. Hello, gentlemen. How are you? Very well. Hi, good. Thanks. Excellent. Good to be with you. Um, John, I'll start with you. I have to admit that even just seeing the term um, based on a Pulitzer Prize winning novel, <laughs> I got nervous for you. Um, is it any more daunting to try to adapt a film that's obviously a Pulitzer Prize winner than just grabbing a paperback novel, you know, at the airport that you'd thumb through really quickly? Uh, or do, or you treat them, do you treat them both the same way? Uh, I guess it is a bit more intimidating. But the truth is, you know, I mean, I read the book for pleasure long before I got involved in any conversations about about um, making making it. So my experience of reading the book was still quite vivid to me. And that's the thing you sort of hold on to, your compass, is 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 trying to be true to that. And and the truth is, you know, you can't really engage with second guessing what people are going to make of an adaptation of it because it's gonna drive you mad. You've got to try and be true to your own response to the material. And then when we started actually you know, in pre-production, getting on with making it, you're too busy to, to, to be second-guessing yourself. You're trying to, to make the right creative decisions about things. And, um, and, and we had a pretty good um, pre-production period where we, well, we talked a lot, didn't we? You and I had a yeah, plenty of did, time. Yeah, we did, we did. And that's, that's what's helpful, is that you sort of, you put those things to one side, as it were, and you try not to think about perception and you think more about what you're trying to make from the inside out. When you're reading a book for pleasure, do you visualize scenes? No. What I mean by reading a book for pleasure is when you're reading a book and if it's, if it's doing what it is meant to do, is working on you as a, as a great piece of writing and as a great piece of literature, and that's all that you are experiencing. I don't think of books in terms of, of um, shots and scenes unless it's probably a not very good book. It's sort of, a book like this just sweeps you up into the world and you just get lost in it. Oh, really? Interesting. And does that ever happen to you when you're reading a story? Yeah, it's you interesting. I was going to say, my anecdote is when I go to the cinema and a film's really boring, I start watching The Grain or, I, you know, I watch little details. Yeah, I, same for me. I read... I read this, I read The Goldfinch as a, a, as a book before I read the script. Uh, I'd been sent it by my agent because he'd heard there might be a film made of it. And my reaction to it is just like I'd read any novel, it's to the story, to the characters and gauging my emotional connection to it or not. You know, that's how I approach it, a book or a script. Interesting. Um, obviously the casting of young Theo is crucial uh, to the film. So talk to me about landing on Oaks, um, searching for young Theo and what you saw in him what, and what you thought he brought to the, to the role. Well, there was a very long process, obviously, which began with our, our great casting director, Ellen Chenoweth in New York, um, wading through hundreds and hundreds of submissions and, um, you know, reasonably quickly. And of course, we're looking at lots of other parts at the same time. Reasonably quickly, Oaks and Ansel sort of came you know, into a smaller group very quickly and, and started circling around them. And, you know, the thing that was of least interest to me in a way was the cosmetic um, likeness of each of them. The thing that was really important to me was that each of them was expressing a certain aspect of what was true to the character in, at, at, the, at that time period. Because what you're like when you're 14 is not what you're like when you're 25, even though the character has, has the same problem, essentially. So, and that followed through on, you know, the, the production. I didn't encourage them to talk to each other about each other's choices. I didn't show them any material from each other, you know, and I trusted that, that, that um, the great hair, makeup and costume departments would take care of the externals of, of each of them um, because it, it, it just felt like it, I didn't want it to be about impersonations. And Oakes had an emotional, to answer your question, Oakes had an emotional vulnerability to him, which young Theo has in the immediate aftermath of those events. And he's sort of looking for an anchor in his life. Whereas young, uh, older Theo is much more closed off. I mean, he has the same problem as, as the younger version of himself, but he's much more guarded. You know, he's, he's almost wearing these bespoke suits like a form of armor. Mm -hmm. And he's a young man about town who's a construction almost, of, of a self-created construction. And he's living in a world, he's sort of in this, this like tissue of lies, which is gonna, either kill him or are going to have to be ripped apart if he's going to survive. And that's where Boris sweeps in. So, so Ansel was the one who sort of was able to embody that quality of being slightly cool and slightly detached, but having enough internal availability that a, that a, that a camera would be able to capture. It was 
they, they were the aspects that I went for. I found it fascinating that the character of Boris um, in each of the time periods uh, opens up uh, a more exuberant version of, of Theo. You know, like when he finds uh, Boris at a young age, it allows him to sort of behave more like a kid. And when, when Ansel finally meets him later on, too, it sort of opens him up to that dynamic, I think, is really important uh, for those characters to connect on. I mean, he's a great character. Yeah. He, he's a, he's he's a great character from the book, eh? But but also, there's something of the trickster about him, you know. That that, and he sweeps into the story, and he's a bit like a pirate as well. I think, you know, he's mad and bad and dangerous to know, and he's the kind of character who'd get you into all sorts of trouble, but is probably savvy enough to get you out of trouble as well, which is indeed what he what he does, you know. So you're absolutely right, and 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 that's why Theo is is sort of unformed, and and certain aspects of himself get formed with. Boris, you know, and in lots of ways, what what the the book was very clear about, and what we tried to hold on to in the story, is that it ha it, it suggests, which a lot of modern films don't like, this idea that romantic love is not destiny, and that romantic love isn't going to necessarily make you happy. That it's almost a busted flush, in a sense, in the in this story. The thing that that is transformative in the story is the power of friendship and not in, an, in a cozy way. I mean, Boris and Theo don't see each other for years, but Boris re-enters Theo's life feeling a, 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 a degree of a need to atone for something mm -hmm. and a need to put something right, um, which is very, very deep and visceral in him. And of course, Anarin brought a great strength to that in the, in the, in the playing of it, you know? So, um, so yeah, so, so, so that was, that's Boris. I love it. Mr. Deacons, I'm gonna assume that every filmmaker with a project would love to bring you on board, uh, that you have a lot of offers uh, for people who would love to collaborate with you. So how do you actually choose the, your next project? Know, it's not really like that. Really? I know a lot of people think it's like that, but but most uh, most directors have a team of people they work with over a period, so it's, it's not quite like that. I I As I said, I had read the book, and my agent said there's a possibility that film might be going, and or being made of it. And uh, so I said, can you put my name in the hat? That's basically what it happened. So. And when you found out his can, name was in I the hat? I tell you my side of that, Please, right? I would which is, of course, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I come side. along. I come along and I go, you know, the, the Roger Deakins, right? And then, then I get word back <laughs> from, from Nina Jacobs and our producer saying, um, Roger Deakins is interested. And I actually did say the words to her, yeah, right. Okay, I did. I, thought, I actually, and she said, no, no, I think it's real. And I went, real? Right. Really? And actually, you know, and, I mean, and, and anyway, it, it's true. I did Lizzy, he will hate this story. Oh. So, so, and we met on the day that I had to go and do a big presentation to Warner Brothers, you know, with, with mood boards and trying to sort of in, encourage them to green light the film, basically. And that afternoon, I hopped in an Uber, came out to your house, and we sat and had a cup of tea and talked about it. And indeed, it was true. Roger Deakins was interested, and I had a giddy moment. Um, of going, oh my God, this is insane. So I, I don't want to be too much of a fanboy. Totally but anyway. why, why wouldn't it be interested in such a wonderful story? I know, but you know, I just, it... it um, you it, would assume he's busy too, right? I was assuming you were busy, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. all out there, they can think I'm busy, that's why I'm you're saying you're sitting struggling. in my house waiting for a job. <laughs> there you go, so he was sitting in his house waiting for a job and I knocked up in the door. And Potential and directors, up and comers, Roger Deakins needs you to work with him, please. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, locations are incredibly important to the different aspects of the story. Uh, and so I'm curious from a visual standpoint also, and just as a director, how you approached filming uh, the Upper East Side versus Las Vegas versus um, a location like Amsterdam and um, what you tried to capture visually from those places to sort of inform where Theo is uh, over the course of his emotional journey? Well, um, uh, you know, some of these things are de determined, they approach them by production. We looked at a lot of Upper East Side uh, apartments and of course there are sound issues and there are issues when they're up you know the, the, you can't you can't get equipment up high you could you know you couldn't light you couldn't there was various aspects of that so we wound up finding a house in upstate New York that could double that the size of the rooms and the architecture was appropriate enough but it was largely on the ground floor that that did great work for us with that um but you know, in terms of our, our approach, it was it was being on the ground, looking. I mean, you just get in a van, you drive, and you walk around, and you respond, and you begin to keep circling the the conversation. Would always come back to story and character, story and character, you know. And then places would become, you know, would fall by the wayside for a lack of practicality, and other ones would keep swimming into view because they offered you something that was perhaps expressive of something. 
um, at the core of the story and, and that we felt was useful. We knew that we were trying to create a palette in the film where each world would be very distinct um, uh, visually in terms of with KK Barrett, our designer. Um, and of course that conversation is going hand in hand with Roger and I talking about how we were going to actually approach the material with in, in terms of style, shooting style, you know. So it's all going on all the time, but it's fair to say nothing replaces standing on a street or standing in a room and walking around, looking at it, looking at it this way, looking at it that way and experiencing it. Yes, I mean, you know, there's a creative and there's a practical considerations. And I mean, originally, as John's saying, you know, the idea of doing the Barber apartment on location you know, wherever it was, Park Lane or Fifth Avenue, where it was meant to be, it would have been a nightmare because it was like five weeks of shooting or something, four weeks of shooting. And you think, yeah, you're up on the fifth floor and why do we need to see the view anyway? It's really about the close-up. Sure. It's not about that. It's about their little internal world. So <clears throat> that went out the window. And as John said, we used this house so KK could dress it and do the wallpaper and make it look exactly what you, you guys felt it was. And then on the other hand, I remember in pre-production <clears throat> the discussion about Amsterdam, the Amsterdam hotel room, was we'd do that on a set for money reasons and either do a backing or blue screen. And when we talked about it, we'd go, uh, really? You know, we're in Amsterdam for so little time and that is so crucial that you feel Theo, adult Theo, is in this room stuck away from the world going through this torment about to kill himself and there's a world outside and I thought the location that <clears throat> KK and the guys found eventually that looked out over the canal was so perfect because there he is with a window that's almost like a cell like he is almost like a picture in a picture and the picture is what we see the view so that to me that was that was a place where it was crucial to see the exterior because the exterior was saying so much about the character. But in the barber apartment, it wasn't. It was just the way the light came through the window. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, you have to balance it within the schedule and the budget, but that's part of this discussion. And can you elaborate on Vegas? Because Vegas to me is such a distinct town because there's such the glitz and glamour of it. And then you guys go to the prefab, you know, mansions that pop up on the outskirts of it, which I think speaks to um, where those characters were uh, in their journey and finding ways to photograph that. Well, in terms of the early conversations with KK, I remember say, saying to him, <clears throat> it, it would be, you know, it, it, in contrast to the world of the barbers, which is a world of, of high culture and a slightly airless quality to it as well. And the, the world of Hobies in downtown, more bohemian world and a more tactile involvement with culture. But when you go to Vegas, you, you're talking about um, an environment which is completely sort of non-historical and, and, and uh, non-cultural in a way. And I had this idea that the kids KK, which is, it would be great if the environment felt like it was no older than those kids. If everything felt like it has oh, no history. and and. Um, and of course, we, we were in, it was Albuquerque, we shot that in. And, um, uh, you know, the, the sque scope and horizon offered us amazing scale for the film. Then. And again, but again, it goes back to emotion, doesn't it? It goes back to yeah. what you're trying to express I mean, about it, those characters. It could have been Albuquerque, it, it could have been Las Vegas, it could have been any number of those towns. The suburbs look the same, they're new developments. Mm -hmm. Half of them aren't lived in, and then particularly even now, but particularly in the story, they were kind of built, and then there was a slight depression, so they were standing empty underwater, as they said, wasn't it? That's the term they call it. So, I mean, but also then for pr practical reasons on working on a film that's not a huge budget, is there's much better tax break in New Mexico than there is in Nevada. Sure, so. of course, yeah. Um, you do have this vast array of characters that are so fascinating, um, even outside of Theo and Boris. And so I'm curious, as you started to tell all the different stories, which are the ones you were most interested in exploring and, and maybe learning more about as you went through the process? Xandra's a great character. <laughs> uh, and and yes. in Sarah Paulson's hands is incredibly vivid. But what I loved about what she did with it, you know, a, a, part, a part which could have become a bit of a comic turn or, or a comic. she held on to a sort of emotional depth to her and you, that you felt her own tragedy and you, you felt the complication 
of her disliking Theo moving into that house, which right. was which was glorious. It wasn't just an evil stepmom, you know. It was somebody who feels that her shot at at, at a dream life with her new boyfriend was was being destroyed by this interloper. You know, that was a that was really interesting. Um, Mr. Silver in this Las Vegas, when he has one scene, who comes to the door, knocks on the door, who who's the the <laughs> New Yorker reinvented himself as a bit of a cowboy out in Las Vegas was a fascinating character. There's definitely a there's definitely a spin-off series there, I think, you know. Um so yeah, it's uh, every which way, you know, that there there's a very vivid cast of characters. And what was unusual about the shape of it, of course, is that you sort of have young Theo or old Theo passing through all these different worlds and a lot of characters in these worlds not not knowing other characters in the world it's kind of discreet as it were you know that that um uh i remember being quite nervous that would that make it feel quite fragmented as a story but I, ultimately I, I i'm quite happy that it doesn't that it all feels of a piece you know but um yeah it's a great rich rich um uh, cast of of. It's what struck, struck me about seeing the final product because when we like you're saying when we're shooting at such amazingly rich characters, fantastic performances, but you don't know how they're gonna how it's gonna appear as a total piece to see them all mesh together, right. and that was to me was just fantastic seeing seeing the cut. You know, I'm just now realizing discussing it with you guys how amazing to have one story that allows you to play in so many different sandboxes with so many different characters that still feel alive. You know, they still feel credible and believable. So that's a gift. That's an absolute gift. Um, in interviewing Miss Paulson uh, yesterday, I got a chance to sit down and speak to her, and she informed me that, uh, and I didn't do the math on it, but halfway through your shoot, you had to stop to allow Mr. Deacons to go attend the Academy Awards, <laughs> and and you w- won your Oscar. M- much shooting. to his reluctance, he, 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 he didn't want to. Shoot. No, was, <laughs> Wait, he had right. to be told to go. Tell me about this, please. I want to hear about this process. <laughs> you can see he's not somebody who's comfortable being looked at, even though he's one of the great visual artists of our time, and he just hates like it. That so word. Stop that word. Look, see, <laughs> not comfortable. So so much happier shooting on a set. Far less happy in a tuxedo on on a stage picking up a statuette. What can I say? So there's nothing more to be said than that. Well so when you came back to the set, it was not a uh, you know the ego dri- <laughs> driving you through the process. Uh, you know what was nice because uh, <clears throat> all the people I was working with, bar the gaffer, were people I've worked with for years and years and years, and a number of them were on Blade Runner. So it was as much for them as me. You know that that was there. Oscar as much, as much as it was mine. So that was that was what was really nice about it. And my it's camera assistant, for instance, I worked with for 30 years. So, I mean, I think it means a lot to them, I hope so. It absolutely should. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, were there other times when you felt like the, the people who did the work, you know, should have deserved the accolade, should have received the accolade because of, of work that you put into another film that you worked on prior to this, that it might have been nominated and you thought, oh, I wish that they were recognized because they did an amazing job on that. Uh, yeah, they've always done such an amazing, such amazing work. So it was nice, nice that I could stand and thank them publicly, really. But I mean, I kind of thank them all the time. So, <laughs> <laughs> and they're still, we're still working together. So maybe that's kind of says something there. Oh, I think that's the legacy then, for sure. Um, the pivotal scene of the explosion, um, so important to the story, obviously, um, but. <laughs> Practically, it's hard to to stage it and to pull it off and to still pull through all the emotion that you need to power the story through. Um, talk to me just about choreographing and setting up how to do the explosion, how to film it, uh, and still allow your actors to get you know through all the beats that you need them to get through, so that the the impact of the story plays out all the way through that you need it to. It's fair to say that the explosion was one of the more sort of worrying aspects of this story, not just technically. It's sure. it's sort of the danger of that event being so massive that it, it creates a kind of center of gravity in the film sure. that the rest of the film, which is actually about a very internal, personal story about a young boy getting stuck in his grief and the shame and guilt he feels wrongly that he's responsible for his mother's death, could be overshadowed by the more melodramatic aspect of that in staging it. Um, so, you know, the way, the way it wound up in the final edit was actually using it 
without even the sound on it. I mean, it, it's it's used at a, at at, a, at the key point of his. It's twice. It's two. It's used twice. You know, one is when he discovers that he doesn't have something. When spoiler alert, that he thought he had, mm. and the other is is in his last moments in the hotel room in Amsterdam that Roger referred to earlier on, and in both cases, it's like a bloom of a of an image that a shard of an image rather that comes back, like um, an expression of almost post traumatic stress disorder and so much of the story that we we kept circling back around how and especially how to approach the the mum the mother mm. uh, um was sort of about about trusting not showing too much and mo- pu- you know, like pushing it down the road as it were so that by the end there's that you you get to see more um rather than doing it in a in a linear fashion which is what the the book did so it was yeah, we, it was very, um, to be very careful with that image that it didn't overwhelm something, but, but, but became one of two major, as he saw it, major um, uh, tragic events in his life. The first being the loss of his mother, the second being the loss of this object. Mm-hmm. And that, that, that's how they were echoing off each other from his point of view, rather than it being an objective event that, then dominated the film, if that makes sense. But also, you only see it as a memory, really. So it's his memory. I, and I think we talked about this, that I don't know if you had traumatic experience, but as a very young child, um, you kind of see things in detail. So you remember little things. You don't remember a big, you know, action movie, wide shot of the whole event. You, you might remember something seemingly insignificant, but that personalizes it. And I think that's what we were talking about before we did the, the details of the hand or the, the flute case. Or, you know, um, it's, it's about those little details. It, it's about Theo's memory. It's not about the vent itself, you know. What is complicated about the um, execution of it, about the choreography and the execution when, when there's a huge pyrotechnic or in this case, it was like an enveloping, you know, wave of, of ash that almost overrun the, the characters when you're approaching it from a visual standpoint. Uh, does it present a larger challenge or, or you've had experiences like that that teach you ways to approach that? Um, well, there's always the element that until you see it, you don't quite know what you're going to get, isn't there? There's this sort of, because, you know, you lined up your cameras and and the the special effects guys made the big pop and it was you know the color was slightly different to what we wanted so we did have some technical challenges afterwards okay. you know but you get one go at it and it was the last thing we got to do on the set for the 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 met okay obviously for obvious reasons so um so there's a certain amount of difficulty around that and you, you know it was the the one scene that you covered from with multiple cameras as well. I mean, we yeah, we that are, one one shot. Yeah, everything else was um, was far more singular. I mean, you know, you're you're happy working with one camera, which is an approach I also love on set. And um, so that's something you guys discussed before finally going into yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That approach. And and why do you prefer, why do you prefer that? I think it's a matter of just concentration. You know, on that one thing, you can only really have one shot on screen at a time. I think it just focuses you on that one moment. I, I think, you know, the whole thing about film, when you run film as a mo- motion, it's all about that one moment. It's a precious, precious thing to capture that moment. I've always felt like that, really. And I think it does something very particular to the set, which is, is, is the concentration, as you say, is that everybody's focus is on that one moment. And it's one of the things that I adore about filmmaking, which is, you know, that there's hundreds of people rattling around and doing this, and this is this huge industrial process going on, you know, and, and, and walls being knocked down, thing, everything can be happening at once. And then everybody goes very quiet for 30 seconds and the focus is on, on that one thing. Right. And, and some, it, you know, it works for other people, but the idea of covering something with two, three, for cameras, unless it's an action sequence where you're going to get one go at it, feels like you're hedging your bets as opposed to working hard enough to figure out what you want to commit with that one shot. And, you know, that, that's what the essence of, a, of the film is. It's a single viewpoint per time. You're looking at one thing. And so making it that way feels quite important to me oh, as well. That's fantastic, just to hear you say that, because I feel like not enough people put that commitment in to concentrate. I don't, I don't think it's that unusual. I mean, 
I've never, I mean, the way we worked, I, that's the way I've worked for 40 odd years now. <laughs> I, I, I guess it was probably the, the way to work when you were shooting on film and, and something maybe now with digital cameras, f people feel, oh, you know, it's fine. It's, it's it, it, you, you know, you're not wasting stock. You just kind of, and it sort of yeah. cheapens more than the actual budget. It cheapens the approach to it, I think, on some level. Yeah, that's a danger of technology kind of like, you know, um, well, that's running the show, you know, you have more cameras, you keep the camera rolling, you, uh, you can move the camera more easily now, so let's move the camera. But that's not necessarily what you should or want to do for a particular moment. In a, you know. And it doesn't make it better. No, it doesn't make it better. It just, it, it just, it, it's, you know, more isn't better. Well, that's a fa fascinating transition to what my last question was. Was this, was it shot on film? Because it looked like it was. It was, and it was shot digitally. <laughs> no, digital. no uh, it, I had the grain and the composure that, that, to me, comes with film. And you've obviously been a proponent of, of shooting more digitally, but you still achieve a look of film. Um, what, where's the technology at now, and where do you see it going in the next 10 years? Are you still uh, championing you know, advancements in digital filmmaking? Yeah, I've only shot one film on film. Hail Caesar was the last thing I did on film. I mean, I just shot a film with Sam Mendes with digital and um, Blade Runner with digital. I mean, I know I, there's so many advantages to digital. I, I said to somebody earlier, I mean, to me, it's like I can be on the set with a calibrated monitor and, and I can be talking to the director about the image and saying, that's what we're shooting. Whereas film, I mean, I know some cinematographers like the mystery of the black box and you'll find out in the morning at dailies. I don't like that. I like the conversation. I like the collaboration. I like, you know, it's, it's all about that discussion and figuring out how far you want to go and, you know. Conversation before you shoot? Like... As you're doing it, or you, or you watch a playback on a monitor on the set and say, well, maybe that didn't quite work or whatever, you know, I mean, yeah. It's much more exact, you yeah. know, and, and when Roger offers a shot, you know that what's being offered is what you're going to yeah. get in six months time, yeah. as it were. It's, yeah. it's there, it, there is, there, it does take away that mystery element, right. you know. I mean, there are other aspects, uh, romantic aspects, that I would feel attachments to film. But mm -hmm. then I guess mm -hmm. I grew up just at the point when it was the crossing over, you know. And um, I guess some of the more technically limiting aspects that happened very quickly when, when the digital transformation happened, you know, it's, it's harder for you to, ex to ex a, a sort of exert a degree of creative control, isn't it, on, on film with labs perhaps than before. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the, the backups going on film now. It's a shame. I mean, I wish it wasn't true. It's a real true, shame. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I love film. I shot film for 40 years or so, you know. Absolutely. And I guess the, per, the projection of it too is improving. The quality of the projection, you know, mm. to the point where I, I had to ask you mm. to clarify whether this was uh, shot that way. So as mm. long as they continue to close that gap between, you know. Well, any, every film now is digitized, unless maybe you're particularly Quinton or somebody who gets a cinema to have film projectors, but there's still not the majority of people see that his films, they're digital projectors. Right, true. So you have a digital file whether you shoot a film negative or not. Right. Um, before they wrap us up, I know we're going to get uh, kicked out of here in one second. Um, we are in the 25th year of the release of The Shawshank Redemption. Um, yeah, film God, that everybody God, who worked don't on remind it me, God, seems God. very surprised that it has the longevity that it does. I mean, what do you recall about working on that film? Uh, I recall when the film got released in the theatres, I think it made 1.5 million. And then 10 weeks later, they tried to re-release it and give it a different kind of publicity. And it made nothing. And then... It was released on VHS and it was on the top for a year. So go figure. <laughs> that was funny. That was really weird. It goes yeah. to show that you never can tell, I guess. You can't. It's very strange. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's a special film for a lot of people, though. Yeah. It yeah. is. It yeah. holds that resonance. So, um, as will the Goldfinch. And so I encourage everybody out there to go see the Goldfinch when it opens. And I appreciate you guys taking the time to speak to us today on the podcast. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you Thanks. very much. Appreciate it, guys.